Hello, good evening everyone. Um, welcome to the first event of Disturbs Visual Cultures Public Program. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Pezzani and together with my colleague Misha Tawan we are uh, co-curating this new uh, program which we have um, titled and, and a series of events gathered under the umbrella term of hostile environment. Um, so before uh, telling you a bit more about the series uh, and the event itself, let me just uh, briefly explain you how we envision tonight's program. Um, after our general introduction, we will have two presentations, uh, each about 15-20 minutes long, delivered by our guests, whom we'll introduce very shortly. Uh, after that, uh, Nishat and myself will join our two speakers here at the, uh, the table to facilitate and take part in a, in a more collective discussion, and after that we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers. Um, so, without further ado, here's a brief introduction to the overall uh, series. Um, in May 2012, uh, the then UK Home Secretary Theresa May announced in an interview the introduction of new legislation in the field of immigration control, aiming to, and I'm quoting, create here uh, in Britain a really hostile environment for illegal migration. Work is underway, uh, she further explained, to deny legal immigrants access to work, housing and services, even bank accounts. Two successive immigration acts, passed in 2014 and 16 respectively, translated this announcement into law, making access to various public and private services, be it medical care, education, housing, work or banking, conditional on immigration status checks, and require governmental agencies to share the data they routinely collect about their users with immigration enforcement agencies. So since then, in a way, a vast range of public servants, such as uh, doctors, teachers, university lecturers, but also private citizens, such as landlords, bank employees, and driving instructors, have been tasked with carrying out immigration checks and thus surreptitiously turn into border controllers of sorts. So one might say that with this legislation, um, the border has infiltrated every aspect of everyday life in ways that, while far from being new, have reached an unprecedented level of pervasiveness. The whole space of the nation, in a sense, has somehow been turned into a hostile environment for those without the right papers. So the aim of this public program is not so much to discuss the original <coughs> effects of that specific piece of legislation, even if we'll, we'll touch upon that too, especially tonight, uh, but rather to ask more generally the question of what happens when the environment, understood here more as a political economic effect rather than a simple natural background to human action, starts to become not only a site of power, but also one of its modes of operation. One that does not work anymore by targeting and disciplining subjects, but rather by altering the milieu they inhabit or traverse. So here we are interested, for instance, in how certain terrains are being weaponized by border controllers, not only the space of the city or that of the nation, as in the UK example, but also the desert, oceans, and mountain ranges across which migrants are forced to travel, often at the cost of their own lives. In these cases, it is the very geophysical characteristics of these environments, their geopower, uh, that has been enlisted and harnessed as a crucial tool of border control, as it appears very clearly when looking, for instance, at the area on which my research has focused uh, over the past few years, i.e. the Mediterranean Sea. We are also interested in how the weather itself, for instance, is being weaponized, and people are made to die of cold or heat across global, or global borders, but also in the ways in which, as Christina Sharp has argued, certain forms of racialized violence have become as pervasive as the climate. We want to explore how this atmospheric condition of power affects different modes of existence, human as well as more than human, particularly those that are classified as alien rather than native. We want to try to attune our senses and sensibilities to forms of suffering and dying that are ordinary rather than catastrophic and crisis-laden. Forms of violence that are invisible not because they are hidden, but because on the contrary, they have been repeatedly and openly made visible in public and constructed by powerful actors as legitimate. We think it is particularly significant to ask these questions now, at the moment in which it might be argued we are already living in the ruins, and the whole planet has been transformed in the hostile environment for some. 
we want to use this occasion to ask what forms of radical hospitality might still exist when all refugia are in the process of being destroyed. So um, we're going to start today with this sort of first roundtable event, um, which is very much looking at all of these sort of issues from the UK perspective. But we're going to slowly sort of shift our gaze elsewhere, um, knowing that what happens here is also sort of deeply entangled in the, all of the elsewheres that um, Britain has also been deeply implicated in. And this round table in particular, I think, will touch on Britain's colonial past and how it intersects with the construction of the so-called hostile environment. Um, and then the next event, which is actually not next week, we're having a small break next week and it's the week after, so the 31st of January. Um, uh, we will hear from Nisha Kapoor, um, who's sort of recently published a book called Deport, Deprive and Extradite with the Inverso. And that book really deals with the aftermath of September 11th um, for the sort of racialized Muslim subject in the UK. And so she, so in that book, she sort of speaks about how citizenship, of course, has always been a privilege, um, but somehow the growth of sort of citizenship deprivation legislation reflects the sort of extension of border control um, from sort of policing immigrants to policing citizens. So this idea, you know, that um, the border regime and securitization that's apparently supposed to protect us all um, is actually in the end becoming a mechanism to control um, citizens. And then as we move away from the UK, we're sort of also um, interested in understanding sort of the spaces that migrants inhabit. So um, we'll have Tom Davies and Arshad Isakji um, coming to talk to us, and they've, they've particularly worked on the Calais camp. Um, and here they've sort of conducted an epide epidemiological study that sort of highlights this kind of perilous environment um, and kind of health conditions to which ra uh, camp residents are sort of affected. So very much, you know, quite literally, they've been sort of abandoned in a toxic space. And then from the concerns of my own research, um, you know, that for me, sort of, there is an interest in sort of trying to think to move away, I guess, from a prevalent focus on thinking migration only from the perspective, let's say, of Europe. So when people arrive at our shores, the story somehow begins. And so um, we're kind of also interested in sort of thinking about the place where people might begin their journeys, you know. Um, and this um, is going to be particularly touched on in uh, the lecture on, in week four, um, and that's by Sharam Khosravi. And his work is um, on Iran and Afghanistan, and he really thinks about the precarious lives of people um, in those two countries that then sort of lead to um, migration. And he works particularly with the notion of waiting and hoping and ideas of stolen time. Um, and then um, I suppose another aspect that we want to think about is the notion of displacement itself. So thinking with someone like Rob Nixon, who sort of writes on the concept of slow violence in relation to environmental catastrophes, he offers what he calls, and I'm going to quote, he calls um, a more radical notion of displacement, one that instead of referring slowly to the movement of people from their places of belonging, refers rather to the loss of the land and resources beneath them. A loss that leaves communities stranded in a place stripped of the very characteristics that make it inhabitable. And so it's a kind of displacement that sometimes occurs without moving or just moving just a little bit. And so the relationship between the sort of um, this kind of displacement and kind of one where you sort of might travel vast distances is perhaps not that big. Um, and so we want to sort of also explore that in, uh, you know, around terms like climate change refugee, for example, um, that are perhaps less helpful for thinking about um, displacement in the way that sort of Nixon is describing it. Um, and this, of course, then ties into what you were saying, Lorenzo, about, you know, ordinary forms of suffering and dying rather than the sort of catastrophic events that are so often sort of um, spoken about in the news and media, etc. And so in thinking about a displacement that sort of occurs without moving, we'll also have a film screening by um, Daniel Mann and Sasha Litsela, sorry, didn't pronounce that right. The fil film is called Solarium, and it sort of deals with this issue. It focuses on thousands of sinkholes on the kind of um, shores of the Dead Sea um, in Israel and Palestine, you know, what was supposed to be a kind of national treasure um, was called a national treasure by Zionists to sort of attract tourism and investment is today this kind of dilapidated site um, that sort of is a, shows how, you know, a colonial project that tried to is instrumentalize nature has failed. Um, so we're going to have that film and then we'll have another film screening by Stephen Cohen, who's an anthropologist and filmmaker and he's worked a lot on the topic of migration and particularly I think he's going to be 
talking about a film about Mayotte, which is an island in the Indian Ocean, which in 2011 became an overseas territory of um, France. And so, of course, then the kind of um, EU border, the external frontier of the EU border suddenly appeared there, so he sort of explores that in his film. And then finally, later on in the series, we will hear from Lindsay Bremner, who's sort of, who's, her research focuses on the monsoon as a kind of ecological system, but as well as a force that somehow designs the Earth. And she's looking at a number of places in relation to the monsoon, but particularly, I think she's going to talk to us about Myanmar, and she'll particularly talk about the Rohingya people. And then we have one last lecture, which is to be confirmed. Um, do you want to say who you think is going to be on? Um, maybe. Okay. No. <laughs> not that yet. one you can wait for. We're not sure about that we one. We have a great <laughs> surprise, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so before introducing our speakers, we just wanted to thank, well, first of all, the Department of Visual Cultures. Uh, uh, Ramon for helping us with, with the recordings, uh, the Migration Research Network, which is also co-sponsoring this event, and also acknowledge that you know many of these topics and ideas have emerged in discussion with the students of the Center for Research Architecture, um, and and so you know inspiration and has, has really come also from uh, from you know teaching and discussing with them. Um, so tonight we are really uh, very, very lucky and, and honored to have two amazing thinkers and, and researchers. And when we started thinking about this program, we, uh, you know, they, they were among the very first names that, that came to our mind. So first uh, we'll hear from uh, Nadine Elenani, who is a senior lecturer in law at Burbeck and co-director of the Center uh, for Research on Race and Law. She teaches and researches in the field of migration and refugee law, European Union law, protest and criminal justice, subjects on which she has published extensively. Her current research project, funded by the Liberium Trust, uh, focuses on questions of race and criminal and social injustice in death uh, in custody cases. Her book, Bordering Britain, with the initial B uh, between brackets, so Bordering, Bordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire, is going to come out with her uh, later this year, and she's going to, her talk tonight is going to draw from, from that book in particular. And then we'll hear from Yasmin Gunarantham, who is a reader in sociology here at Goldsmith, uh, where she teaches on questions of race, feminism, disability, uh, sorry, disability, cultural representation and research methods. She has authored two books, Researching Race and Ethnicity, Methods, Knowledge and Power, and Death and the Migrant. She's one of the co-authors of Go Home, The Politics of Immigration Controversies, and has edited several collections, including a jar of wildflowers, essays in celebration of John Berger. She's on the Editorial Collective of Feminist Review and Media Diversified, and is a published poet. Um, so please join me in welcoming our speakers, and I invite um, <laughs> to be here and a great honor to present alongside Yasmin. Um, and thank you all of you for coming um, today. Um, so yeah, uh, as Lorenzo said, I'm gonna kind of speak from um, the book that I've been working on for a long time. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested to see, um, you know, what kind of discussion um, comes out of it. So um, <clears throat> the book, um, looks at British immigration and asylum law, and it looks at the way it has not only been shaped by Britain's colonial history and its fluctuating imperial <coughs> ambitions, but also how law and immigration law, um, and asylum law in particular, um, are themselves assertions of colonial power. Um, so the way I understand violence in the book is um, to try to think about it as structural or slow violence. So the violence that the border produces embodies a double meaning of atroci atrocity. It's not only sudden and terrifying for the migrants beaten, abused, and shot at by border guards at fortified crossing points around the world, but its roots also lie in slow violence. Slow or structural violence is more difficult to identify than the sudden violent spectacle. In my work, I try to reveal the hidden and often conveniently ignored histories of racialized violence, 
a violence that is normalized and legitimized. And it is precisely the legitimacy with which racial violence is laced um, that I seek to destabilize through my work. And for me, this does demand a focus on law. So I argue that Britain, I argue in the book that Britain is the spoils of empire. And British immigration and asylum law is the colonial state at work. It is through law that the colonial and racial project of capitalist accumulation is maintained over time. British colonialism is thus an ongoing project sustained by the structure of law. And I'll come to explain how, how I get to that point in this paper. So in the context of migration law, it's important to note that law's violence is dual. It, is not, it not only serves as the means of obstruction of the vast majority of racialized people from accessing wealth accumulated through colonial dispossession, so in the form of immigration law, whether that's visa requirements um, or other regulations placed in the way of the ability of people to move, um, but it is also the primary means of recognition for migrants seeking legal status. The result is that people who are seeking um, a, a status become trapped in regimes of recognition, whether citizenship, migration, or refugee law. And these work to buttress rather than challenge the idea that Britain and everything within it, with, within it is the exclusive purview of Britons who are conceived in large part as white. Britain is a young nation state, but an old imperial power. It was not until 1981 and the British Nationality Act of that year that um, severed a notionally white, geographically distinct territory now known as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland from the remainder of the colonies and Commonwealth. As a consequence, the presence and Britishness of racialized persons already on the British mainland has since been in question. Thus, racial exclusion has not only manifested at the border, but also internally with the confinement of racialized people to sites of extreme deprivation, predominantly in the inner cities. I argue, therefore, that Britain is a space of domestic colonialism in which racialized people are denied access to vital resources and are disproportionately subjected to violence, incarceration, deportation, and death. In my reading, the hostile environment policy is a reassertion of exclusive white British entitlement to colonial spoils, and just one example of the withholding of access to colonially derived wealth and infrastructure from racialized people. In the book, I show how following changes to immigration law in the 60s and 70s, racialized Commonwealth and colony citizens lost their legal association and right to travel to Britain as citizens of the United Kingdom and colonies. This was an all-encompassing status set out in the 1948 British Nationality Act in an effort by the British government to hold what remained of the British Empire together. These legal changes saw the epicenter of colonialism move to the metropole, to accomplish domestic colonialism, a violent sense of entitlement and superiority was instilled in the British psyche, just as it had been in the era of the white supremacist project of the British Empire. British people have thus been taught that their national project is a white project. The justificatory idea behind strict immigration control is, after all, that the hordes must be kept out because they want what white British people have. At the same time, a facade of inclusion built in the form of legal paths to status recognition, which doled out British citizenship to select racialized people who could fulfill certain criteria. However, the vast majority of racialized people with ancestral or geographical histories of colonization were prevented from accessing Britain through the operation of internal and external borders. The 1981 British Nationality Act introduced a concept of British citizenship based on the 1971 Immigration Act's notion of patriality, that a right of abode, the right to settle in Britain, is granted to those born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain, most likely, of course, to be white. The move was both materially and symbolically significant. A territorially distinct Britain and a concept of British citizenship that made Britishness commensurate to whiteness made it clear that Britain, the territory, and everything within it belongs to Britons conjured up as white. The effect of that patri patriality clause was basically to allow white Commonwealth migrants coming from the old dominions, Canada, Australia, um, to be able still to travel to um, Britain, and for, um, but um, racialized Commonwealth and colony citizens lost their connection to Britain.
As Wells and Watson write, whiteness as an embodied national identity is a highly exclu exclusionary notion of Britishness that essentially conflates being British English with being white, Anglophone and Christian. The effect of the 1981 Act, along with changes to immigration legislation, was to put the wealth of Britain gained via colonial conquest out of reach for the vast majority of people, whether inside or outside the borders. And so I understand the spoils of colonialism, not just as being um, what you find in the British Museum, but also things like opportunity, future, welfare, jobs, and everything else that people take um, relatively for granted. Um, people within Britain's borders are denied access to these through policies like the hostile environment, and they're unreachable for those outside, but also, of course, those outside, in order to access Britain, have to travel irregularly themselves, traversing dangerous and hostile environments as a result of immigration laws, as well as agreements between EU and non-EU countries. Sarah Ahmed writes, what is reachable is determined precisely by orientations we have already taken. Drawing on Fanon, she argues that a world that was made white through colonialism is home only for bodies that can inhabit whiteness. Bodies remember histories of colonialism, even when we forget them. Histories of colonialism thus surface on the body. The result is that race becomes a social as well as a bodily given. Racialized people are always acutely, especially at risk of being, in Sarah Keenan's words, repelled, unsettled, or realigned. Colonialism has meant that the vast majority of racialized people have inherited the impossibility of extending the body's reach. In Ahmed's words, um, they must travel, of course, irregularly and carry with them the weight of colonial history, a burden they have inherited. In view of this often neglected historical context, I interpret the hostile environment policy and the 2016 vote to leave the European Union as examples of ongoing and contested white nationalist claims to wealth accumulated by colonial dispossession. The 2016 referendum on Britain's EU membership created a space for the, for the accentuation of claims of exclusive white entitlement. The Leave campaign constructed migrants as unjustly enriched and undeserving of access to territory and resources presented belo as belonging to white British people, illustrated, of course, in the rhetoric of taking back control. In a piece that has proved remarkably prophetic, Ron Ware argued in 2008 that societies where whiteness has historically conferred some sort of guarantee of belonging and entitlement, these present an opportunity for political mobilization in the name of white supremacy. In view of the colonial configuration and ongoing dispossessing effects of British migration law, scholars and migrant rights advocates need to be wary of arguments which center legal recognition as the basis <coughs> for inclusion. Such recognition-based approaches require applicants to fulfill various requirements, whether in the form of meeting the legal definition of a refugee or naturalization eligibility criteria. The focus on rights-based approaches in the migration literature is problematic because it both obscures and legitimizes the colonial structures underlying British immigration and asylum law. Despite being built on colonial theft, the British state derives legitimacy in part through processes of legal recognition of immigration status in the form of recognition as a refugee or through the bestowal of citizenship. The Windrush scandal of 2018 is illustrative of the challenges posed by recognition-based arguments in the context of migration. The hostile environment policy, as we know, finds legal expression in the Immigration Acts of 2014, 2016, and the ensuing amendments. The heightened scrutiny of immigration status required by this legislation led, as we know, to thousands of people suspected of not having irregular migration status being detained, deported, denied access to housing, healthcare, education, and financial services, and at least three of those deported we know to have died. The outcry which led to, the, to a government apology, a resignation, um, and the establishment of a Windrush task force to deal with those affected by the hostile environment measures um, was frequently framed in, ter um, in terms which served to propagate the very same liberal politics of recognition. The argument goes that the Windrush generation were British citizens when they arrived in Britain, following the 1948 British Nationality Act. For instance, David Lammy, instance David Lammy MP, one of the most outspoken critics of the hostile environment policy, frequently made this argument. He wrote in The Guardian, and I quote, last Thursday during the last of her statements to the House of Commons, the Home Secretary said illegal 23 times but did not even once say the word citizen. Last Wednesday, the Prime Minister said, we owe it to the Windrush generation and the British people. 
This is the point the government still doesn't understand. The Windrush generation are the British people. Their citizenship is and always has been theirs by right. I argue that the insistence on the Windrush generation being citizens, a claim also made by several scholars, while fulfilling an important immediate strategic purpose in individual legal cases, has the effect of legitimizing the colonial British state's immigration regime. The focus on recognition of legal status elides the reality that the 1948 British Nationality Act wide casting of the net of citizenship was done with the explicit purpose of reinforcing Britain's imperial power so that it could go on benefiting economically and politically from its colonies. Through the 1948 Act, the British government was asserting its overarching power of recognition over the Canadian government's assertion of its sovereign power through the articulation of Canadian citizenship. Um, the reality is that once um, Windrush, the Windrush generation began to arrive in Britain after the 1948 Act, the British government did everything it possibly could outside of forcing, passing formal immigration legislation to prevent their arrival, um, including things like lobbying Caribbean governments, um, trying to uh, get them to stop the migration happening at source because it was extremely uncomfortable and against um, um, co uh, Commonwealth and colony citizens of colour coming to Britain. So the narrative that we're hearing in Parliament all the time is that they were welcomed here and they were brought here to um, uh, rebuild the country after the war. In fact, Britain was actually trying to um, take as, much, as many um, white refugees as possible from um, <coughs> camps across Europe and tried to avoid any kind of... Um, um, uh, normalization of migration um, from um, the colonies of um, Commonwealth and colony citizens. So once British rulers' um, commitment to the Commonwealth, essentially for economic purposes, began to, to dwindle, then formal immigration um, legislation sealed Britain off um, from those it had colonially dispossessed once and for all. It's clear from the Windrush scandal that conditions of coloniality are inescapable. The emphasis on citizenship buttresses rather than challenges the official narrative on Britain's colonial history as an era symbolic of its global strength and inclusivity. David Lammy thus spoke in Parliament of the remarkable greatness of Britain that allows me to be here. This discourse enables the hostile environment's effect on the Windrush to be presented as an aberration rather than as part of a continuum of colonial violence, perceptible in the fabric of everyday life for the vast majority of racialized people in and outside Britain. <coughs> Presenting the racist state violence experienced by the Windrush generation as exceptional works to preclude the adoption of a broader, connected, anti-colonial, anti-racist resistance strategy. Britain remains racially and colonially configured with racialized descendants of colonized and enslaved peoples made disproportionately vulnerable to premature death, as we have seen in the Grenfell Tower fire in June 2017 and in the course of Britain's imperialism masked in the language of humanitarian intervention, international trade and European cooperation. Drawing on Fanon, Glenn Coulthard has argued that empowerment and freedom from the colonial state requires turning away from the assimilative lure of statist politics of recognition and towards our own on the ground practices of freedom. I suggest that irregular migration is such a practice of freedom in embodying a powerful claim to entitlement to the spoils of colonialism, as well as a physical act of reclamation, whether in the form of accessing welfare, healthcare, infrastructure, employment, and security. In view of the crucial role played by countries and populations with histories of colonialism in growing and sustaining the British economy, coupled with the habitual official denial that Britain owes anything to those it colonized and enslaved, Irregular migration today can be seen as having important redistributive properties. Redistribution occurs not only in the practice of sending back remittances, but also in the taking up of physical space and through the use of resources in Britain. Further, the presence in Britain of racialized people from countries with histories of colonialism has the effect of challenging and troubling white supremacist structures. Sarah Keenan has noted the way in which significant political potential can come when particular bodies that do not belong according to dominant networks of belonging nonetheless remain in that place. This troubling occurs in part through the physical redirection of resources towards people from his, those who are historically dispossessed, but also in serving as a defiant reminder of Britain's colonial identity and the origins of its wealth. As Doreen Massey has argued, the arrival of people constructed as being from the past in British imperial narratives meant that distance was suddenly eradicated, both spatially and temporally. Migration was thereby an assertion of coevals. <laughs>
Irregular arrivals and their presence forces a redistribution and reparative element into the relationship between Britain and its former colonies, an element otherwise refuted formal acknowledgement. It is precisely for me the irregularity, the illegality of the relationship that gives irregular migration its radical anti-colonial reparative and redistributive dimension. In being illegal, it amounts to a forcible return of something that was stolen in, the con in a context in which the laws being breached, immigration and border control measures, are designed specifically to obstruct such an outcome. The migration studies field must be reframed with irregular migration being understood as anti-colonial resistance and host states as colonial spaces. A politics of freedom which resists that of recognition would, in the words of Bell Hooks, at the least require that we stop being so preoccupied with looking to the other for recognition. Instead, we should be recognizing ourselves um, and seeking to make contact with all those who would engage us in a constructive manner. Thank you. This is a really difficult point in terms. I really appreciate you showing up. Um, and also thank you um, to Nisha and Lorenzo for inviting me. And I've just realised that Nadine's really powerful presentation says some of the things I was going to say. Um, so I'm going to cut short my beginning sort of discussion of Windrush. But I think what's really interesting is um, I've been working for a couple of decades with dying migrants in British hospitals, hospital, uh, hospices and homes. Um, and then more recently, as, as Lorenzo pointed out, I was involved in a collaborative research project on, which, on Operation Bacon, which some of you will know through the so-called go-home vans. And I've been really interested in the um, intersection of those two projects. So one, um, which I've been working away at for a long time on slow violence, really, and, and how it affects people when they die, uh, racialized migrants and exiles and then the other project which is more on the sort of border as spectacle um, so I'm going to sort of talk about how I've tried to bring those together and also to think about them um, but one of the things that Nadine has really talked about is the sort of hypocrisy and the contradic contradictions of Windrush and I think what that really showed in relation to the spectacular bordering which Theresa May and um, her colleagues tried to put into force through their immigration campaigns in, from 2012 is this more domesticated and absolutely racialized insecuritization. So bodies stay in place but the border moves underneath you or you might fear that it does. And so life, refuge and care are displaced and your milieu suddenly turns and falls away. And so that's what I'm kind of really interested in talking about. This has been sort of discussed in a, in a lot of different literature. Some of you might know the literature on social suffering, and we've, we've already spoken about Rob Nixon's work on slow violence. But something about the insidiousness of the slow, drawn-out violence that I've been interested in and how this is embodied so um, Arthur Kleinman and colleagues have really got this evocative image of the soft knife of social suffering. And this sort of violence is so ordinary, dis so ordinary and dispersed that we scarcely recognise its damage. Life is difficult after all. Some of us walk through scores of injustices every day. There's little time to reflect or to make strange. Perhaps the best we can manage, to use Claudia Rankin's words, is the worrying exhale of an ache. That's from Citizen. And um, when she talks about the everyday weight um, of living in, with racism in North America. And yet Lauren Ballant has also remind us, reminded us that shifts in thinking about, or apparently ignoring injustice from the foreground to the background, are not really a certain habituation of not thinking and that not thinking, she says, should not be collapsed into thoughtlessness. And to quote her, being overwhelmed by knowledge and life produces all kinds of neutralising effect management. Coasting, skimming, browsing, distraction, apathy, coolness, counter-absorption, assessments of scale, 
picking one's fights and so on. So these are again what Kathleen Stewart would call ordinary effects. And this is what I want to really sort of engage with, the toll of the government's hostile environment or the mobilisation of a hostile environment as a state, a structure of feeling and a technology. And I just want to start off um, with saying, so there was this, there, as Nadine's pointed out, it's this real hypocrisy and outrage about what was, what was happening to Windrush, but I also want to sort of put a face to some of this. This is Dexter Bristol. He came to the UK aged eight in 1968 to join his mother from Grenada. He collapsed and died in the street from heart failure in March 2018. And his mother, Santina Bristol, believed his death was caused by the extreme stress he'd been under in trying to prove his immigration status and to get his um, documents together. He was sacked from his cleaning job in 2017 because he didn't have a valid passport and he wasn't able to claim benefits as well um, because officials didn't believe he was in the UK um, legally. When his health started to deteriorate, he didn't go to the doctors or hospital believing that he didn't have the right to. There was a coroner's inquest into um, Dexter Bristol's death in August 2018, which refused to make the Home Office an interested party in the hearing. And it recorded, and this is really important, it recorded a verdict of death by natural causes. He was prepared to fight but as the months went on and he was required to find more evidence, it became very difficult, immigration lawyer Jacqueline McKenzie said, and we saw him just decline into a shadow of himself. This is the deadly outcome of the politics of environment, the naturalisation of violence. And being reduced to a shadow is an evocative imagery for the diffuse, slow violence of imperial racism and how it's imbricated with contemporary border regimes. So rather than focusing attention, which has been done very recently, um, I think from about 2013 and very much so around 2015, um, attention has been focused on catastrophic and tragic death. I think we should also be studying and following the longer trails of border violence in hospitals, in the community and in our homes, <coughs> or as Fanon would say, in the clinic. And I want to talk a bit about Fanon's biomedically inflected black analytic and its concern with the phenomenological weight of colonialism and racism. Black Skin, White Masks was one of the earliest texts for me to connect and diagnose racism as a toxic climate for racialised others to live under colonialism was to live, and this is to quote Fanon, in a constellation of delirium frequently bordering on the region of the pathological. The use of the medical term delirium is really significant here, suggesting not only Fanon's background, but also how colonialism produces absences and ellipses that gorge out an unsettled presence in ways that can be both expressed as but also exceed um, psychological pathology, and that of which delirium is a symptom. The biological and the social of Fanon are entirely entangled in his analysis, but he also instates a really important pathway, a, a critical pathway, social justice leading to bodily suffering, connecting the life of the clinic to politics, and Black Skin is full of Fanon's phenomenological descriptions of the day-to-day -day impact of li living with colonialism and racism as a weighty elemental, elemental and temporal force that constrains what he called the corporeal schema of the black body. In that now sort of iconic scene of encounter between Fanon and the young child and the white mother on a train, look at the nigger, mama, a negro, Racism is a temporalization, a recourse to primitism. primitivism. Fran Fanon finds himself nauseous. To quote, battered down by tom-toms, cannibalism, intellectual deficiency, fetishism, racial defects, slave ships. The injured, dehumanized black body is recast in this encounter. It becomes an archetype, 
moving more slowly, more wearily in the world. I progress by crawling, Fanon writes. I think we owe Fanon a huge debt for this rendering of colonialism, <coughs> racism and white supremacy as slow as suff and suffocating weights. And an interest in the pace, particularly in tempo of violence, has also been a concern, um, as both Lorenzo and Nadine have said, in, in environmental <coughs> humanities, and particularly I've been interested in the work of Rob Nixon. Um, and his work is really on the slow, dispersed scattering of the effects of climate change and environmental disasters such as toxic drift, deforestation and oil spills. And he describes them in quite a Fanonian way as being this, this is a violence that is driven inwards, somatized into cellular dramas of mutation that remain largely unobserved, undiagnosed, and untreated. And it's the tempo of these types of bodily violation that he sees as instigating a collective ignorance and forgetting. So I often think about slow violence almost like time-lapse photography where you can see a flower, you know those nature films where you see a flower bloom and then die. And so there's something about the belatedness of this work that, that's quite haunting for me. So there's this geologizing of political thought in relation to the long drawn out temporalities of hostile and toxic environments in which certain vulnerable bodies are worn away or reduced to a shadow and this is where the feminist discussions of weathering have been really important to me and make a valuable contradiction. Um, but before just going on to say something about, about those discussions, I want to make just an important, one important point. And that's, although the hostile environment kind of names a seemingly exceptional sort of contemporary moment in British politics, hostile environments go hand in hand with what Claire Colebrook has theorised as the imposed stabilities that colonialism has violently imposed on human mobility. So this is a book that came out last year, which her chapter is in, and it's called Transcendental Migration. And she argues, rather than see nations as blessed spaces that accept refugees, one should see the nation as the outcome of a violent expulsion of the migratory movements that are its original and ongoing con condition. So she's actually talking about deep time there um, and longer migrations. So I just want to keep that in mind um, and to think about this intermeshing of the material and the political and how that's been rendered in more recent discussions of weathering. Um, and the weathering hypothesis was first sort of put forward in the early 90s um, in Health by Arlene uh, Jeromis, who suggested that the early deterioration of the health of African Americans was the result of social exclusion, and she called it weathering. And weathering has also more recently been used um, by Christina Shah to describe the toll on and the endurance, but also the inventiveness of black bodies living in climates of racist violence. In what I am calling the weather, she explains, anti-blackness is pervasive as climate. The weather necessitates changeability and improvisation. It is the atmospheric condition of time and place. It produces new ecologies. And Astrida Nimanis and Jennifer May Hamilton have, um, in a recent article in Feminist Review, have also linked more and taken the me meteorological emphasis and weathering and connected it with Sharp's work to talk about weathering in relation to an ethics of exposure and how uneven that exposure is for certain bod bodies and also politics of shelter. So if we go back to environmentalism and also a theme in Claire Colebrook's chapter was about refugia. So there's sort of a, a hint there towards how we might think of um, futurism or utopias. So my interest in weathering is how it might be used as part of a multi-scale analysis that includes bringing together different genres and forms, so empirical data, social and cultural theory, theory poetry, images, art, and literary fiction, to acknowledge and trace not only the impact of latter-day hostile environments, but also the ongoingness of the violations of the imperial past. <coughs> 
Um, by empirical, um, multi-scale empirical practices, I mean sort of bringing together and juxtaposing also different material, temporal and effective strata, such as those often collaged so beautifully by the poet Claudia Rankin and by the filmmaker Arthur Jaffa. Um, and uh, a good example, um, if you're interested in, in scalar analysis, I think is in Tiffany Page's um, work on self-immolation among refugees. And in this, in this article, she concentrates on uh, the self-immolation of Syrian refugee Mariam al kawai And what's really interesting is rather than being lured by the spectacularness of the events of self-immolation, she changes her temporal and spatial gaze to look at the everydayness of um, Kuali's life. I began to realise, she writes, that some deaths that we think occur quite quickly may instead be slow and eked out, not over minutes, but rather over months, years and generations. And there are parallels there with Jasbia Puar's work on theorising of economies of debility. And the relevance of Poir's work to hostile environment politics is how it highlights the increasing weight of biopolitical climates of racialization, and particularly she was interested in settler colonialism in Palestine, on racially marked poor, queer and disabled bodies. And I've been very interested in disabled bodies. I think disabled bodies are completely marginalised in migration um, until the point at which they are become disabled and debilitated through crossing uh, borders, for example. Um, so when migrant researchers and activists begin to attend to the inter-animations inter of disability, debility and weathering, the inadequacy of language um, and narrative to experience is only a part of the problem for me and the challenge of scalar analysis. Because weathering can press in on bodies unseen, and because disability can also change around and shuffle subjectivity, scalar analysis, in my experience, has to entail speculation. Um, and Luciana Parisius describes a feature of the speculative method as one that demands a thought to become felt, fact to become potential, imagination to supersede observation, object to affect method, method to become transformative of the object. So just to sort of ground this and to just tell you about some of the work that I've been trying to do with this, is one of the ways that I've incorporated speculative approaches into my research has been to turn to art and literature. In fact, where I found some of the scattered effects of the hostile environment is in um, new diasporic fiction where there are examples, for, um, for instance, of dementia, diasporic dementia, and how that rearranges scales of time and place. Um, so I've been really interested in how art can be more receptive and hospi hospitable to the ambiguities of weathering, as they can be expressed in this lovely term um, from Alice Ol Oswald, the broken thought machines of end-of-life conditions. So I've been particularly interested in researching end-of-life hallucinations, deliria, dementia, but also the rich metaphorical language of end-of-life wishes. Um, so I'll finish with an example of how I've used case stories that meld empirical and imaginative materials to engage with weathering. And in choosing to document um, this this story and how I've chosen certain lives and deaths. I've been very mindful of the scalar approach of different black um, feminist writers, and particularly Sadia Hartman's exploration of transatlantic sex slavery. And rather than um, what she tries to do is that to sort of go away from the shocking and the terrible to some extent, and she says, I've chosen to look elsewhere and consider those scenes in which terror can hardly be discerned. And the rationale for turning towards the banal for Hartman is to illuminate the terror of the mundane and the quotidian rather than exploit the shocking spectacle. That some skepticism is required to accept um, the lines that Hartman draws between the quotidian and the spectacular, and this is Fred Moten's point. And what concerns him 
is how the evoking of the traumatic event or events can serve to preserve the appeal to the very idea of redress, even after it's shown to be impossible. And this is really important. It's something that I struggle with as an activist about how to petition for justice while also recognising the impossibility of that demand. So what Moton is alert to is, and to quote, is an irredeemable and incalculable suffering from which there is no decoupling, since it has no boundary and can be individuated and possessed neither in time nor space, whose commonplace formulation it therefore obliterates. So we're talking about space not as topos there, we're talking about a different sort of space as well. So I'm just going to uh, finish with a, a poem that I scripted from an interview, and I've been very interested in working with actors in what I've been calling empirical performance. And this is with, with somebody I interviewed who was dying, had lung disease, he'd worked in the construction industry with asbestos, he was a Windrush mi migrant. Um, and he lived not far from here, from Goldsmiths in a high-rise tower block. So I'll just stop and just play this. Um, and, and also to say, I've been very interested in Grace Cho's work, where she says the work, I guess, what we're thinking about, is to assemble what she calls a collective psychic apparatus. So I'm really interested in how we might develop sort of queer of colour feminine sense organs. So how might we pick up on some of this? I just want to finish there, but I also wanted to include a gesture towards or an engagement with also futurism. 